Thank you, Joe Quinn, for the great introduction. So, as Joe Quinn says, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the founder and CEO of the 311 Institute, the World Futures Forum and Exponential University. So the 311 Institute is a global futures and deep futures think tank where we look at the current day all the way through to the next 50 years. So what we call the future and deep future. And the reason why we do that is because if you're a multinational organization, typically you want to look at the next 20 years perhaps, but if you're a sovereign government, you often want to look at the larger picture, that 50 year view, and see what the future of energy, infrastructure, healthcare, the welfare state, financial services, and so on and so forth might actually look like. So today, I'm going to be having conversations with you about the future of water, particularly as it relates to 2030, and particularly as it relates to Spain and Europe. Now, in 2010, the United Nations General Assembly came together and determined that access to affordable, safe, and reliable drinking water is a human right. But today, a lot of people still find it very difficult. In fact, over 2 billion people still find it very difficult to gain access to safe water and water that is managed well. So this shouldn't be a 21st century problem, but, in true 21st century style, it's actually being exacerbated by a variety of mega trends that we'll discuss. Now, when we have a look at the problems when we look at the future of water and water consumption, we live on a watery planet. It's called the blue dot. You know, when astronauts go into deep space, when satellites, especially like the Voyager probe, at a distance of billions of miles, look back in, at our blue planet, they always remark that it is a pale blue dot hanging against the dark. Now, the water crisis was really highlighted to me about three years ago when I was visiting Johannesburg and Cape Town down in South Africa. Now, in South Africa, they were about a month away from reaching a point called day zero. Now, day zero was the point in time where the cities would run out of water. So not only did we see water rationing and see people fighting over water, which then kind of leads us to this concept of water wars that we'll talk about in a bit, but from my own perspective, when you're being told not to flush the toilet, when you're being scolded for washing your hands, when you're actually showering in a bucket, suddenly the value of water is put into stark contrast for you. And let me say, it's not something that you want to experience on a day in, day out basis. Now, when we have a look at our watery planet, 90, over 97% of the Earth's water is saline. About two and a half percent is fresh water, but out of that fresh water resource, only about a half of a percent of all water on Earth is fresh water and accessible to human society. Now, this kind of leaves us with a significant problem, especially when we actually consider our own future as a species. So today, out of all of the water that humanity consumes, 70% of it is consumed by agriculture. 30% is consumed by humans. However, as we have more people on the planet over the next 10 to 20 years, those people are going to want to eat more food. We have a growing middle class population at a global level as well. And middle class people apparently want to eat more protein, which means that we need more livestock. Those livestock need more crops, which means that as we move into the future, agriculture starts using even more water. So where does that leave us as a human society? The cows will be fine when it comes to getting water, but we might find that our taps are running dry. That's not an acceptable situation to be in, but we have some solutions, which I'll come to. Now, all of these problems are exacerbated by climate change because it's increasingly common to see the wrong kind of rainfall 
falling on the wrong place. So this is where we see floods, like we see in Germany. You know, they have rainfall, but it's torrential. Yeah. Meanwhile, we see states like California that are now suffering with 95% water stress because not only have their rainfall patterns changed, but their snow patterns have changed as well. And it's a lot of the snow that when it melts actually feeds the Colorado River. And from a Californian perspective, for example, we now see some reservoirs, some hydro reservoirs like Lake Mead getting so low, as well as the Hoover Dam getting so low, that quite a number of states in the United States are worried that their hydroelectricity dams are going to have enough water to generate electricity. So not only are those particular states starting to run out of water and exhibit extreme water stress, they're also at risk of running out of electricity. It's not one problem, it's two, but it's all being exacerbated by climate change and a variety of other different trends. But from a climate change perspective, we actually have solutions today. So for example, the transition to green energy, we see a lot of different industries actually becoming electrified, which helps us reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, which are historic highs. We see carbon capture and storage systems coming through as well, albeit at a very small level. So we do have solutions. We also have some agricultural solutions, which are very important in this space as well. Now, from a climate change perspective, not only is climate change dumping the equivalent, the nuclear equivalent of five atomic bombs worth of heat into our oceans every second, which actually is causing the oceans to heat up and actually swell, which is then actually accelerating global sea level rise, which is now at four millimeters per year, this itself starts giving us other water problems. For example, as we see global sea levels rise, bearing in mind that over the next 10 years, we could very well see 59 major cities starting to go underwater. In addition to that, that will put another 1.5 billion people at risk. We have the concept of seawater ingress. So as sea levels rise, seawater not only starts polluting viable agricultural land, but it also starts in some areas, polluting the freshwater aquifers that we all rely on for our water. So we have these multi-dimensional problems that we need to solve if we want to solve the future of water. This then sort of brings the United Nations to sort of coin this phrase, water wars. Because not only do we see extreme weather starting to change where rainfall is falling, not only do we see increased agricultural use, human use of human use of water, but in addition to that, we also see wars over conflict zones, for example, the Nile. So we see a lot of countries now who are underwater stress, who are guarding their precious water sources much closer than they ever did before. And if you have a look at the Nile, which flows through around five different African countries, we have Ethiopia now starting to come up with new water policies, which could actually be at the detriment of Egypt. So we have all these tensions coming in all these different places. By 2030, it's estimated that over 129 countries in the world will be under extreme water stress. Now, extreme water stress is the point in time where you can't grow crops or you struggle to grow crops. Another problem. That also means that over half the world's population are going to be living in areas in extreme water stress, which is another problem. And from a European perspective, it's estimated that by 2030, over 50% of all European river basins will be facing water scarcity, a problem that is especially pertinent in Spain, which is now suffering drought after drought after drought, and whose population is now starting to really feel the impact of what happens when water isn't flowing as freely as it perhaps once was, or perhaps could or should. And of course, when we have a look back in history, whether it's the Mayans, whether it's the Mesopotamians, there is no getting away from this fact. If you don't have water, you don't have a civilization. 
Try living without water and see if you can. You can't. So just to be clear, if you don't have water in a particular area, for example, you don't have a civilization in that area. Now look at the challenges that we're facing. So we've talked enough about challenges and the problems and everything else, and we all know those basically replete. However, let's talk about solutions. So for example, on the one hand, we see increasingly utilities and water operators are talking about smart cities and smart operations. So this is from source to tap, and this is where we can talk about gathering new data sources from a variety of different places that we've never been able to gather data from before. So when we talk about alt, the ability to capture alt data, we can capture hyperspectral data from satellites that not only tells us what the soil moisture is for a particular region, but it can also tell us ice depth, for example. It can also tell us the weather patterns. It can tell us which areas are more likely to experience levels of water stress versus water abundance. We can even capture the sounds from water pipes and then use that, aka kind of predictive maintenance, to predict either where leaks are going to develop or where they already actually are. Um, so when we have a look at the ability to capture huge amounts of alternative data from different sources that traditionally the water ecosystem and water operators wouldn't have actually captured before, we've got a lot of different options. We've got automation, which helps us improve the efficiency with which water is managed. We've got digitization, which increasingly helps us capture data, analyze data, spot patterns, and create new policies and visions and strategies, basically for water management today, but also in the future. For example, smart meters. Um, we have predictive maintenance. So I've already sort of discussed that predictive modeling. So as we get more data, we can predict which areas are going to be under water stress, which areas aren't, which areas basically are using more water than they perhaps should or could, and so on and so forth, so that we can start targeting them with sensible education campaigns. We also have risk management. So again, the more data that we can capture and model, basically the better we get with risk modeling and risk management of our water supplies. However, you know, when we start having a look at infrastructure, everything's going smart. Stick a sensor basically onto something, attach it to a 5G network or a traditional sort of Wi-Fi network or whatever it happens to be. And all of a sudden we can capture data on everything from everywhere, even down to the epidemiological, ep epi even down to the healthcare level. That's it, I can't say that word. Um, even down to the healthcare level where today we're actually able to detect COVID particles basically in our water systems and sewer systems that we can then use to inform national healthcare and pandemic strategy. So smart everything helps us capture more data from more things so that we can analyze it and then we can create better policies, visions and so on and so forth. Uh, when we start having a look at water treatment as well, the cost of water treatment is actually coming down as well. So for example, with single step technologies like graphene, we're able to increasingly take filthy water, literally filthy water, and you can drink it straight through a straw as fresh water right there with using no energy, and no electricity, which is just an extra benefit. But when we start scaling these systems up, the cost of water treatment starts dropping. And the reason why that's useful is because when we have a look at water reuse and recycling, suddenly we have a way to reduce the cost of water reuse and recycling and so on and so forth. Um, we have robots that are increasingly going into the sewer system. So for example, this is, this is Enimal. Uh, this particular uh, robot sort of goes around the larger sewer systems and everything else, looking for cracks, looking for chinks, basically in the pipes and things, basically that really sort of shouldn't be there. Um, like ironically, as I saw in New York, other robots that are stuck at water junctions that then mean that particular municipalities need to turn off the water to particular neighborhoods because they've got a robot stuck basically in the pipes, uh, which is a bit of a different story. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, when we have a look at some of the smaller junction pipes, we have small sort of snake-like robots that are increasingly going down those systems to again, look for cracks, look for problems, break out fat bergs, basically as we see in London and all these sort of other horrible things that you find in the sewers, maybe the occasional alligator. And in Spain, over 15% of all water is lost through pipes. Similar story, basically around the world as well, bearing in mind that the average age of pipes now around the world is around 46 years. You know, these pipe systems were built to last, 
but in London's case, for example, they weren't really designed to last for over a hundred years. So we have a problem with infrastructure that increasingly we're throwing technological innovations and solutions at, and we're actually moving the dial, but it's a gargantuan task trying to keep these sewer systems up and running and, vol and viable. Now, in addition to other things that we can do, we can reduce our water consumption as a society. Now in Spain, thanks to education, thanks to smart meters and water saving devices, over the past few years, they've managed to drop the average water consumption from 171 liters per person in 2000 down to 132 liters today. Now with a population of 35 million or so, that's a significant saving. But there's more that we can do. So from an agricultural perspective, we can roll out precision agriculture. So these are slow precision drip feed systems, for example, new irrigation systems, as well as other sort of technologies that at the top end, it's estimated, will help save agriculture's agriculture using 20% of the water they use today. However, you know, the vast majority of these systems aren't running at full capacity, they aren't deployed fully, so we're seeing about a 10% water reduction across the world using precision agriculture systems, um, which does move the dial, that's it, but we need to move the dial even more when we start talking about agricultural use of water. And now this is where we can start talking about new agriculture and food production methods like vertical farms. So if you take a, ver a traditional vertical farm, which is where we grow crops under LED lighting, for example, in something like an Amazon or a Walmart or a Cardo warehouse, or just the basement around the corner, all of a sudden we can create closed loop systems and we can reduce the water consumption of a vertical farm, which can produce eight times the amount of crops that a traditional farm can, guaranteed because it's not exposed to extreme weather and climate change and all the other sort of weather events that destroy crops, by 95%. Now, there is one technology that I will talk about in a moment that lets us reduce the amount of potable water that growing crops use by 100%. Can you guess what it is? Bet you can't. Um, now, in addition to that, so we're solving sort of, you know, we are growing crops in new ways that let us dramatically reduce the footprint, the water footprint of agriculture. However, when we start having a look at animals, coffee, which then sort of brings us to dairy and so on and so forth, we have solutions here too that you can actually go and see today, that you can eat and taste today, that you can buy today, even in Singapore restaurants, for example. This is the new way to produce food, the future way to produce food, the futuristic way to produce food. It's called cellular agriculture. Now at a really high level, because this is a topic in itself, this is where we either create coffee using different chemical compounds and everything else. So you have what we call molecular coffee. But stepping back from that a little bit, this is where we can take a cell from an animal, whether it is a chicken, a duck, a cow, a fish, a peacock, if you really wanted to. We put those cells into a culture in a bioreactor and we create something called clean meat. Now clean meat is meat without the animal. And you can go and sample this with, for example, KFC's fast food program, or future food program rather. And you can also eat chicken nuggets that have been made from real chicken without ever killing the chicken in Singapore. Um, but we can apply this same principle of being able to produce food without the need for the animal or the original plant or the fish just from cells. Because cells grow infinitely. And so we harness what goes on inside of an animal, just outside of an animal, in a lab or in a bioreactor. Now, if you think about these two slides, this is, these are just a few ways that we can reduce the agricultural water footprint from 70% global consumption today to not a lot, which then means that from a humanity, from humanity's perspective, we move from consuming 30% of the water 
to 60 or 70 percent of the water, which actually means we end up having more water at our at our disposal, which is a good thing. Now we can also recycle water. In Spain, 12 percent of water is recycled, and that's the highest rate in Europe. But when we have a look at California, California are now starting to spend 750 million dollars on a new water recycling station and program, we're starting to see water recycling becoming a much more front and center topic as we move around the world. Now, other things we can do is we can regenerate fresh water sources. So for example, there, all of us know of rivers basically where pollution, you know, sewage is just being dumped straight into the river. We also know of areas basically where there's huge amounts of filth and litter and disease. We shouldn't be looking after the world's most precious resource in this way. So we need to significantly improve our stewardship of the water sources that we are responsible for. Now, in addition to that, we also need to consider sustainable water sourcing because as we start draining aquifers, for example, if you look at Jakarta, they are draining their water aquifers so fast, the city is sinking so much, they are actually considering moving the entire population somewhere else. We need to be able to achieve balance when it comes to sustainable water sourcing, which again comes down to water stewardship, water management, but sort of this big picture vision that we should all be creating, particularly as organizations and governments. We then have desalination. 97.5% of all of the world's water is saline. Technically, it's just sitting there waiting for us to use. If you go to the Middle East, 95% of all of their water comes from desalination plants. And this is the world's largest desalination plant, and this is based in Abu Dhabi. But the cost of desalinated water is still triple the cost of potable water which means that really it can only be used in particular use cases. You wouldn't use desalinated water in agriculture, for example, because it would push the food prices up. However, when we start having a look at trying to reduce the cost of desalination, on the one hand, we have new filtration systems that I've discussed, which are helping lower the cost. We have new energy systems because desalination is an energy intensive process. So renewable energy costs are also approaching zero so we have two ways just there to reduce the amount, just to reduce the cost of desalinated water. However, if you have a look at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with cities like Neom, they've creating, or they are creating a new kind of desalination plant with new kind of filtration systems that are able to extract lithium and uranium directly from seawater. Because when we have a look at lithium, Lithium concentrations in seawater are 5,000 times higher than lithium concentrations anywhere else on land, on terra firma. Now, the reason why this is important is because you can create a new revenue stream. So in Saudi Arabia, they're actually looking to mine lithium from seawater, sell that on the commodity markets. And of course, lithium is underpinning the future and current electric vehicle revolution. Lithium ion batteries need lithium. So all of a sudden in Saudi Arabia, not only do they have a way to start reducing the cost of desalination, but they also have a way to create a new revenue stream. And when you start blending these revenue streams, all of a sudden you have a way to significantly drop the overall cost of producing desalinated water. And then, of course, you need the infrastructure investment to build desalination plants. And we're seeing an increase in the amount of investment going into building desalination plants and systems and so on and so forth. So this is one way that arid areas could actually make desalination work. However, and there's another way. Yeah, I sort of spoke earlier about uh, the problem that we have with distributing water, moving it from where we source it from to the tap. Pipes break. Now, using advanced technologies like 3D printing, companies like GE and the US Defense Department have been able to 3D print new kinds of heat exchangers like this one. This is a passive heat exchanger. It doesn't use any energy. But what it is able to do is it's able to draw over 500 liters of water 
directly from the Earth's atmosphere. So there are an increasing number of these systems coming through. They're called direct air capture systems. Because while we might actually live in a desert, even if you live in the Sahara Desert, a system like this is still capable in arid conditions of drawing two liters of water per day from the air in the Sahara Desert. Because the Earth's atmosphere contains huge volumes of water, zeta, at the zeta scale, when we talk about gallons. And in fact, the Earth's atmosphere contains so much water that we can condense using these systems to create fresh water that each and every one of us on this planet could actually have access to 2.4 million litres of water at any given time. Now, personally, I think that goes some way to solving some of these future water wars. These technologies inevitably start off expensive and rather niche, but inevitably the costs come down, they become easier to deploy, they become more commercially mature, etc, etc, etc. They get embraced by regulators, they get baked into the processes and integrated into different products and systems and solutions. So we do have a way out of the future water wars. But we do need to actually be sensible. We need to transition different things from different places to new places. But we have the technology. We have the innovations that we need. And this is just touching the surface of the sea. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And uh, have a great day. Take care. Goodbye.